Welcome back. So, more of Torghast has unlocked. You can now go up to layer 6, soon to be layer 8, and that means, well, it's getting harder and harder and harder. Of course, a lot of WoW players are not as used to game types like Torghast, which is really more of a game within a game. So, with it now all getting a good bit more hard, it's time for our Torghast guide. So we're going to teach you things like all of those pesky puzzles and also how to actually play to win in Torghast and just a bunch of tips and tricks that are going to help you get the most out of Shadowlands' big, big, fancy new feature. And speaking of those, you should add a great new feature to your internet life with today's sponsor, Dashlane.com. Dashlane just makes your life easier by generating and auto-filling your passwords and personal info through its extensions. And that means that you never again have to manually type in passwords. Pretty awesome. It even works on phones, giving you security and convenience wherever you are. And all your information is decrypted locally with your master password. And that means that even if Dashlane servers were hacked, it would be like breaking into the bank, but then finding out that the bank doesn't have the key to the vault. They also have got dark web monitoring, a VPN, and if a site that you use is hacked, they will send you a security alert. So, stop filling in your personal info and using unsafe hackable passwords and try Dashlane for free on your first device at dashlane.com forward slash Bellier. You get all that, one app across all your platforms with my link. You'll get the 10% off, which is all pretty awesome. Thank you to Dashlane for sponsoring our team. And with that said, let's go. First, let's talk about floor clearing strategy and how to actually get strong enough to survive. The most important thing is to get as many anima powers as is possible, including ones from the brokers. And that basically means that you have to be thorough. And that can be quite different to the World of Warcraft mindset of gotta go fast that we sometimes see in dungeons. So kill and loot every mob, break every breakable pot, complete every puzzle, explore every nook and cranny, including climbing the chains in the Mortregar wing. The easiest thing you can also miss is soul remnants. I think a lot of people just pass these over. You'll find them trapped in anvils, cages, or otherwise bound. Uh, you know, they're these souls that you click and free. Now, each of these gives you a stack of soul remnants blessing. That increases your primary stat by 1%. Now, the thing here is, over a course of a run, you can get well above 20% extra of your primary stat from this, and this makes it a huge part of your damage scaling. And damage scaling truly is the important thing, especially as you go up the layers. So all in all, your goal is to become as strong as is possible, because once you get to those higher floors on the higher layers, it does actually get extremely difficult, and Torghast has got built-in anti-cheese mechanics. Put simply, the boss always comes down to a DPS check, and that's even more so with Blizzard Hot fixing them a bit. And uh, more on that when we talk about enemies. But okay, let's move on. The thing that makes Torghast replayable, and, uh, well, can basically decide whether or not you beat a boss or get a really, really good run, especially as we go into Twisting Corridors, is your collection of anima powers. There are so many, of many different flavors, but the key is this you need to pick up the ones that help you scale like crazy. Now, this means over time, you should build up an understanding of what anima powers synergize, how they actually work together. As an example, paladins can get cheaper holy power spenders. They can then buff their holy power spenders with two separate powers um, and even generate passive holy power. Uh, you can get it so that these various things can complement each other and massively boost your damage and your self-healing. Another really good example is one from the mage with their invisibility one-shot combo. So for that, there's a power that grants you extra damage in your next Frostbolt, Fireball, or Arcane Blast whenever you break pots. And that stacks up to a thousand percent. But then there's another one that increases the damage of those spells by 2000% whenever you cast invisibility. Combined, these can one-shot bosses. So you've got to think about these things. And then even without insane combos, most classes have got anima powers that help to scale up their damage quickly, and that's what matters. Look for percentage bonuses to your main single target abilities and prioritize those over just about anything else. Yeah, when you run into Torghast first, you'll find lots of, you know, epic quality utility ones, or maybe, you know, it modifies your soul shape or something, but those things are kind of useless if you can't, at the end of the day, out-DPS your enemies. 
Defensive powers, they can be useful if you are prone to mistakes, but we really have found that in the majority of cases with Torghast, like the, the super severe damage can be mitigated or avoided by good interrupts in CC, and ultimately it's your throughput that's going to matter, and your ultimate goal is basically to become as broken as is possible, because otherwise, by the time the scaling happens, you need to outscale that boss, and if you don't, you won't stand a chance. If you pick only defensives, you're really going to struggle in Torghast runs. So, if you are smart, or, and lucky, you can become a nigh unkillable death machine. But realistically, it is a roguelite, you may just have to come back and try again, because at the end of the day, this mode of World of Warcraft is an entry in that genre. Next, let's talk about Phantasma, the currency. So, on every floor three, there is nothing but some anima souls, definitely pick those up, and a broker. Floor 6 will also have a broker, uh, sometimes the same broker as you got on Floor uh, 3 before the boss. Now, the strategy here is simple. First, you've got to look for any anima that synergizes with your build, and generally avoid wasting money on the utility stuff if that money could otherwise, you know, later go into a useful anima power. Then, you'll very much want to purchase the plundered anima cell to get a random power for your group. That's super important. Now, the flat stats on the Oberon armaments are usually cheap and attractive if you've got any Phantasma left over, but there's one even more important item, and this is one I think a lot of people don't really know how to use super well, and that is the Ravenous Anima Cell. This is expensive at 250 Phantasma, but it instantly kills mobs, and it drops a special power based on the mob that it kills. Now, this is really important. Now, you can get 65% fire damage resistance in the soul forges from the firecasters, uh, stacking 25% haste on kill from the forsworn in Coldheart, or immunity to the very annoying death pulls from the death souls in Mort Regar, right? Those are all really cool abilities you can get by using this, um, this anima cell. Now, for a huge damage boost, it can also be used on the Mossworn Archers or Interceptors. Doing that will actually get you an extra 20 to 30 soul remnants. That's pretty big. So as you can see, these Anima Cells can be pretty game-changing if they're used right. Uh, now, these ones that we've mentioned are the ones to really focus on, but there are other, like, important ones, including 400 Phantasma if you actually use it on the Broker. But that's a bit of a gamble, because that Broker will remain dead if you're unfortunate enough to find the same one again later. So if you use that and killed your Floor 3 Broker, you could get to Floor 5 and find out, oh, the Broker's dead because I killed him earlier. Uh, so, there's that. Um, also, you should um, pick up extra death counts when you can at the Brokers, and uh, the 30% damage during combat potions if you've got enough Phantasma left over. Those are especially good for that final boss. Next, let's talk about dealing with enemies. So, there are far too many to go into in super big depth here, but we can establish some good principles that will be vital. At the end of the day, and well, there's so many things. We see a cast bar and it doesn't matter to our character. Not so on Torghast. The most important thing is you actually pay attention and actively play, right? Lots of mobs have extremely dangerous abilities that need to be avoided or interrupted. Now, for examples you've probably already seen, the melee moss worn cast um, interruptible self buffs called um, Accursed Strength. They do that and then they try to one shot you with massive strike. You can't let that happen. The flame casters have inner flames. You need to interrupt that because that's a massive feel that also buffs their allies. Basically, you need to figure out what abilities need to be interrupted, and you need to actually hold interrupts and stuns for those abilities. I mean, thankfully, it usually is self-evident if you actually pay attention. There's also no shame in pulling like you're leveling a warrior in WoW Classic, right? Just use all your tools to your advantage, go slowly, take your time. If in doubt, you can use a ranged ability and try to separate mobs, right, so you don't get overwhelmed. Those are all important things to do because at the end of the day, you do have limited deaths. So knowledge and your interrupt key, they hold all the power in your day-to-day -day Torghast gameplay. Regular mobs are one thing, but the elites, rares, and bosses are something else entirely. Most of them have got challenging mechanics, and they'll really feel challenging as you climb up the layers of Torghast, uh, but there's one detail that sets them apart, and that is unnatural power. This is something most people don't seem to know about, but to stop kiting and tank-slash-healer-only cheese being vi uh, viable, Blizzard have made it so that all elites stack a buff every few seconds when in combat. Now, this gives them 10% damage and move speed per, uh, per stack, but most importantly, it makes them CC immune at above 10 stacks. It actually used to include being interrupt immune, but that's since been changed. 
There's no smart way to deal with this, right? You just need to kill them before that ticks up too much. It's a DPS check. So whenever they're pulled, elites need to be priority as any, you know, unavoidable damage soon does just become fatal because that will take up. Now this essentially turns all of the big fights in Torghast into DPS checks. And that's hopefully where your crazy anima builds and actively playing that system and really thinking, how am I building this into something that's cohesive? That's where that's going to come into play. Now, rares might be a bit intimidating, but they are definitely worth killing. The powers that they drop can be extremely good for your run. Now, that can come at a price. They are often very punishing, and the scariest example of that is the Subjugator rare. So, he casts a variety of big, ground-targeted abilities that need to be avoided, because each hit reduces your damage, speed, or health, and uh, the only way to clear that is to actually waste his anima power, right? Because it will let you either get a cool power or clear the debuffs he's given you, so you need to do that right. There's a sneaky tip, though. You can just die to remove those debuffs instead if you feel like you've got the spare deaths. Now, in general, each rare has got pretty intuitive mechanics, so just do those and nuke them with everything that you've got. Next up, then, we've got the bosses. Now, they have got a wealth of abilities to constantly dodge or interrupt. Uh, you know, they do hit like trucks, and they just have tons of health. You know, as a BM hunter, it's been nice enough, but for a lot of people, it's a struggle. There's too many specifics to get into every single boss, but they're all using basic World of Warcraft mechanics, interruptible spells, ground-targeted or bullet hell, sort of like laser-style attacks to avoid void zones, unavoidable spells, white damage, it's the usual combo. But the real problem, more than their mechanics, is that ticking clock, right? Because every fight is a race against the unnatural power stacking buff. And this is where the most important parts of Torghast actually do come into play. With all that covered, let's go over exactly what you need to succeed in Torghast. Number one, gear. Torghast does not scale with your item level. It's not one of those features. So the stronger your character is, like, yeah, the stronger you're going to be in Torghast. And this should make the higher layers easier after, you know, each week as you gear up, though they're never going to be a walk in the park because of the scaling. Now, bringing buff items like, you know, food and stuff, that can help. So if you've got anything cheap lying around, you may as well use it. Uh, you'll definitely need to bring at least some food, though, for these soul forges, because basically you'll need to counter the ticking damage torment that's active there. Another thing is skill. That's it. Skill is a really important factor here. A critical factor here is just learning how to maximize your DPS while avoiding damage. This is something where the quality of an individual as a player and their ability to engage with WoW mechanics just legit matters a lot. So, you know, your largest issues are going to be getting hit by unavoidable damage or spending, you know, so much time avoiding damage you fail to beat a DPS check. So that's just when it gets back to you know, stutter step. Only move as much as you need to. Always be casting if you can, using your spells, checking your class guides, maximizing your DPS. That stuff is legit, really important here. Then also party comp, that's super important. Uh, healing, survivability, mobility, and CC are all core things for Torghast, and if you're lacking any of those things yourself, you really should bring someone who can actually cover for you there. Mob scaling is interesting though, because it's actually reduced for four and five player groups. And that does mean that the, basically your ideal composition is a self-sufficient tank, a healer who can pump out serious DPS, um, and then, you know, one to three varying DPS players. Uh, so far, we found that Torghast has been easy to solo for the likes of the Paladins and the Hunters, you know, with the right damage anima powers. But for some classes, like the Shadow Priests, they're really struggling, and that's often because of things like having long interrupt cooldowns and limited mobility. Now, even if you are one of those less fortunate classes, you should be able to solo with a bit of luck, patience, and skill, and really thinking about the anima powers. But if you are struggling, look, tanks and healers are doing really well. I mean, like, in a group, right, because of how that enemy scaling is actually working. Then the other aspect is anima powers that are critical. You know, as we mentioned earlier, getting as many anima powers um, and as much phantasma as possible is absolutely necessary here. You're going to need those things. I'd say focus on single target damage and um, upgrades that complement each other. Big thing with single target damage is whenever you kill an enemy, you've taken its DPS and its mechanics off the board, so it's worth doing that. Then moving on from that, there's the upgrades from Venari. So there's quite a few permanent Torghast upgrades that you can get from her, and you're really going to want them because they are pretty damn nice. Of course, though, more of those will unlock as your reputation with her gets higher, so... 
Yeah, do your mod content. I've been slacking on that. Now, things there include increasing the amount of flat stat powers that you can find. That's a really good one. And also being able to ignore your first death for the death counter. But later ones increase the amount of choice that you get in anima powers. That's really good. And also increase the chance of you getting epics and uh, actually giving the vendor better stuff to sell. That stuff's good. You should pick those things up as soon as you can. Yep, the maw. Don't slack on it because the upgrades are worth it. Okay, last but not least, let's talk about traps and puzzles. You'd be amazed how many people just, the traps, they keep on walking into them and you kind of wonder why, and it's really easy. So there's a lot of this stuff in Torghast, we're just going to run over how to deal with a whole lot of it. Okay, for traps, these can be dealt with by just a little bit of patience, which sometimes is in short supply with WoW play, but patience. You'll eventually learn how to recognize where the traps are in no time, but for the first while, pay attention to things. If there is a scratch mark on the floor, that means there is an axe. Just walk up to it, wait for it to pass and go. The same goes for the fire blast traps and uh, the upper reaches, um, its little sort of bullet line traps. It's just like crossing a road. Uh, for the ground-based fire traps, Look closely because they will actually highlight what burner is going to turn on next, so pay attention to that, learn the pattern, and go through nice and quickly. For the bullet traps, you'll just have to run through the gap. Uh, this one can be a little bit difficult sometimes because of the hitboxes, so use a defensive or have one at the ready if you're not sure. Um, but yeah, just learn what the traps look like, pay attention to them, and eventually you should not be able... You, you should be able to feel what floor has got what and not get hit by things. And the same actually goes for the anima mimics. You'll have seen these. So if you spot an anima power that is suspiciously alone in a room, very high chance it's a mimic, which means just go trigger it and kill it because it's going to have good stuff. Okay, puzzles. These have uh, provided some serious frustration to many players already, but actually they're not that bad once you learn them. So we're just going to do that. Okay, let's cover the most notorious one first. The unmarked lever chest. People love it. Um, this looks like we're missing an important detail, but you're actually just supposed to guess. But the trick is to guess efficiently. Um, Brasolis on Reddit posted this image back in beta, and it basically tells you what to do. So set all four levers to the same position, and then click the lever that matches the red highlighted position on the chart. There are 16 combinations to check, and you can try all of them using just 15 clicks in the way described. So for there, it's, it is guessing, but it's about doing it efficiently, so follow the chart. Then the next puzzle is the rune marked vault. This one is also surprisingly simple. Uh, your goal is to get the right combination of runes. There's four things to click, and each changes one, two, three, or all four of the runes. So the way to solve this is to solve these things one at a time. Find the one that changes all four runes, and then click it until the chain disappears. Then do that for the three, the two, and the one. That's it. It can be a little bit overwhelming, but you just do it in that order and you will always win. Now the last puzzle is the lock puzzle, and that's basically just a sliding block puzzle. There is no quick and easy solution to this one, but it is pretty intuitive. You just need to get the three straight line blocks in the middle. Um, it might take some getting used to in terms of time, but uh, if you just focus on one block at a time, you should get there. Um, it can also help if, instead of moving the block you want to where you want it, you make empty space where the, um, basically empty space uh, where you want your block to be, and then work backwards from there. Um, you can also freely rotate any block of four and use unwanted pieces on the outside to swap blocks in and out. Um, we'll show, basically we'll show um, an example of a quick solve on the screen here. Uh, if you just analyze that, because you kind of have to see it to really get it, uh, then you'll understand. Also, if you want some practice, uh, you could just look up a 3x3 three three sliding block puzzle online and uh, try to put blocks one, two, and three in the middle. Easy enough once you get the hang of it. And of course, getting the hang of all these things is important because every one of those traps you see, it's another anima power, and it's all about scaling your character up real big and chunky by the end. So to close this off, uh, that's that's it, right? That's everything that you actually need to know to survive in Torghast. There is no quick hack, right? 
There's no special thing you can do. So really learn to play this with the same principles that lead to a Binding of Isaac run or a Hades run being successful and you'll do really well. And if you want more success in general, uh, you know what, try out Dashlane because uh, you'll get more success if you're not just manually entering passwords all the time, which is a bit of a drag and uh, also, you know, don't have unsafe passwords. Dashlane gives you more security and more convenience. That's really good because usually more con uh, security means less convenience. Not here, that's why I use them. And a big thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. So. That's it for me. Good luck in Torghast, especially as, you know, Layer 8 opens up the same week as Mythic and as we uh, get into the Twisting Corridors to get that Corridor Creeper mount. Thanks, I'll see you next time.